We're still in 1 Timothy chapter 2, so if you want to open up your scriptures there, we will, um, that's what we'll take a look at today um, as we um, heard the scripture earlier um, during the service. And so as I um, um, think about the passage of scripture that we, that we um, read, uh, I came up with the title of Godly Behavior in Church. And as I have that title, Godly Behavior in Church, it reminded me, especially of my childhood, of things that um, I would have hear about how you're supposed to act um, when you're in church. And so a question for you, you don't have to answer out loud, but a question for you to think about is maybe you think about your childhood, is have you ever been told to behave in church? It's time to, this is a place to behave, right? Uh, now I have some very vivid memories of this idea of how important it is um, to behave in church. So when I was a boy and we visited grandparents in Virginia, we'd go to church, Snow Creek Christian Church. And so we were in church and my aunt um, played the piano or the organ, and so she'd be up there on the stage. And my grandmother, she sang in the choir, so she would be up on the stage looking straight at us. And myself and my cousins, so my cousins is their mom, my aunt, um, uh, we, would be, we would sit every Sunday on the second row by ourselves. Um, I don't know where my papa sat. He was, he, he was one of the deacons, and I know he was involved with, with the communion and offering time, so I'm not sure where he sat. He didn't sit with us, but we would sit there by ourselves in that second pew. Um, but we knew that, you know, most of the time, you know, we try to behave ourselves in church, right? And, but we knew that if, you know, we started to pinch one another or to say something funny and start to giggle or laugh or, you know, something like that, all we had to do was look up. And if we looked up, we'd see my aunt, their mom, staring at us from the piano, right? And then we'd look over and we'd see my grandmother um, staring at, our grandmother staring at us. And those eyes told us it's time to behave in church or you'll pay, right? And we knew, okay, we've goofed around too much, we're going to behave in church. So that's one of my memories about behaving in church. The other memory I have is about um, running in church. You've probably been told, I was told, you don't run in church, right? And so uh, we would, you know, go into church, It'd be Potluck Sunday. I love Potluck Sunday. I still love Potluck Sunday, right? And it would be Potluck Sunday, and I knew there would be a lot of food, and it would be delicious, right? And so, um, we, you know, we loved potlucks. Plus, um, after potluck time, after we've eaten, my cousins and I, we were free to run around and play together. We didn't see each other every day. Um, and so, you know, after church... Um, in at, you know, at grandparents or at potlucks or things like that, that's when we had time to run around and play around together. And so, um, so you know, potluck's over, parents are still talking, you know, especially the moms and grandmas, they're still talking, and, um, and so this is our time to run around and play. Now, we did it mostly outside, so we're running around the building, even running around the cemetery, I mean, all sorts of things, just running and playing. But every once in a while, we would go into the building, and there was a basement. And in that basement were the Sunday school classes. And there's this long hallway um, that goes down through the basement where all the classes come off of, that, off, off of that hallway. So we were told don't run in church, but we didn't think it applied in the basement. And so we would run around, play hide and seek and run and play tag all through the Sunday school classes um, in the basement. And one particular day, and I don't even know why, but I was carrying a broom. And maybe I, we were going to tag each other with the broom. I don't know what we were going to do with that broom. We weren't going to sweep up anything. Uh, but I was carrying this broom. And I'm running down the hall, chasing my cousins. As I'm running down the hall, the broom's in front of me, so I'm bringing it up, and again, maybe to swing at them or something. So I bring it up, and as soon as I brought it up, boom, it hit one of the lights that were in the, in the hallway. And these, I remember, were the old lights that used to be in the sanctuary, and they upgraded them, and they brought those other ones downstairs in the, in the hallway. And so it just, just destroyed that light. Glass everywhere. And I remember immediately, fun's over, right? 
I didn't behave in church, I'm going to get in trouble, and I don't even actually remember what happened. I don't think I got in that much trouble. I think I had to help sweep and clean things up. Um, but, but, but it reminded me again of that teaching that I had growing up of you don't run in church, you have to make sure that you behave in church. And so um, that's what I think of when I think of good behavior in church. But Paul, he's going to talk about something else. Paul is writing to Timothy, and he's writing to Timothy about you know, leading the church and helping this church that has some problems, probably from some false teaching that has happened. And so uh, Paul is helping Timothy to help the church to have good behavior in church. Basically, as they worship together, as they fellowship together, as they have their lives together to live the life that honors God with this good behavior. He's not talking about kids, about running around or laughing in the pews or anything like that. He's talking about adults, and he's talking to Timothy to teach the adults, this is how we are to act when we're together to worship the Lord. And he's going to talk to the men, and he's going to talk to the women. So let's see what he says to the men and women. First, to the men. Paul's instructions to the men. It's in verse 8. Therefore, I want the men in every place to pray, lifting up holy hands without wrath or to, and dissension. Now, sometimes the word in the Bible, in fact, verses earlier, uh, the, a word that is that we translate man or men is a word that's um, a little bit more general. It could be men or women, okay, people, okay? But there are, in the Greek, very specific words that mean men or man and very specific words that um, are translated woman or women. And this is a, one of those very specific words uh, for men. He is talking to the men in the church, not just everybody, but he's talking specifically to the men. And he has some instructions for the men in the church. And the instruction is to pray, right? He, he's instructing the men to pray. Uh, now, he's already, remember last week, we looked at it already, he's already told everybody to pray for everybody um, already, but I think here he's looking at men in the worship services and how they are supposed to pray and how they are supposed to behave as part of the Lord's church. They're to pray, lifting up holy hands, he says. Now, it's interesting that Paul talks about hands this way. He says, lifting up holy hands. Now, I don't know how much you think about your hands involved in your life, but when you talk about your hands, they really represent a lot of things that you are involved with in life because with your hands, you're going to reach out and touch and embrace a loved one, right? With your hands, you're going to make a living. You're going to do work. With your hands, you're going to spend money, that money that you've made. You're going to complete projects. You're going to show your emotions with your hands. And with our hands, um, both good or evil are done, right? We, so we think about our hands kind of represent our life and what we do and who we, who we are. Um, so others can be helped with your hands, but sins can be committed with your hands. So our hands represent us. And so even when you hear this and you read this in Scripture, recognize how your hands represent you. I mean, you think about it, about, about your hands and how we, you know, we, we look at our hands. I, I remember seeing those commercials about age spots on your hands, Right? Now I see the age spots. So that's telling me something about me. And, um, and Arthur, had, not that Arthur, but a different Arthur, has visited one of my hands. You know who I'm talking about, arthritis, right? And so, um, so I have a little, a little arthritis in this knuckle, right? And so it reminds me, oh yes, I'm getting older and, and things are not working the way they, they used to work. And I know some of you suffer with arthritis um, in more than just your hands. And so, um, so when we think about our hands, I mean, we think about our life and, 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 um, and rec recognize, yeah, my, my hands, this, this is a little bit of a representation of my life. 
Now, to the Jew, and as a Jew, Paul would have been, he would have grown up being instructed to pray lifting up your hands. That's how he would have prayed. Okay? You know, we're not taught to pray that way. But for the Jew, the, 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 the view of them praying, of, of the person praying with their hands up and open is that they are entreating God, they're asking God and opening their hands to offer their life to God and also opening their hands to receive the blessings of God. And so that was their posture when they prayed. They would stand they would stand and they would raise up their arms and raise up their hands outstretched, and that's how they pray. Now, we pray a little differently as part of the Western culture. Um, in fact, I, again, you think of growing up. Growing up and going to that church, that Snow Creek Christian Church, they had um, a stained glass um, window behind the, 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 um, where the choir was and the baptistry was, and um, it was... Jesus praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. And I don't know if you remember what that picture looks like, but what I'll always remember is Jesus leaning up against a big rock, right, with his hands clasped like this, praying, okay? And I, and I, I mean, because that's how we think about praying. If it's, if it's time to pray, we probably fold our hands, right, or clasp our hands or bow our heads we do different things than, you know, we can see how culture li you know, leads you to you know, the posture that we think about with prayer. Um, in fact, I'll always, I'll always remember Mr. Hanks. He was the preacher at that church, and he did his pastoral prayer every Sunday, and sometimes it went long. And so there are times, I'll admit now, that I open my eyes. You know, because he's, he's praying and he's still praying and he's continuing to pray. And I would look, but boy, when I looked, he impressed me. He was out there like this with his hands out in front, clasping them together and praying to God. He looked serious. I mean, he looked like he was really praying to God. I was, imp I'm just, I was actually impressed by that as, as somebody who was young about, man, he's dedicated in his, his prayer to God. And so we think about, you know, we think about clasping our hands, folding our hands, bowing our head. That's how we think about praying. But again, to Paul and to the Jewish background, Jewish culture, and which would have been uh, part of what he was teaching the church, he was, he, was, he was using the imagery that he knew. Lift up your hands to the Lord in prayer. But not just any hands. Holy hands. Lift up your holy hands to the Lord. And the Bible speaks about holy hands, especially using the term clean hands. One place is Psalm chapter 24, verse 3 and 4. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord, and who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to falsehood and has not sworn deceitfully clean hands, and a pure heart. The psalmist put those attributes together. Clean hands, holy hands, would signify a clean heart, a holy heart before the Lord. And James, a writer in the New Testament who, who really had a feel for the Old Testament writers. Um, in fact, in his writing in the New Testament, he sounds a lot like an Old Testament prophet he wrote in James chapter 4, verse 7 and 8, Submit therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. So James gives a little exhortation here that we need to have clean hands, and we need to have pure hearts. Paul is coming the other direction and said, okay, men, this is how you need to come into worship. This is how you need to lead worship. This is how you need to pray. You need to pray lifting up holy hands, clean hands, which means you have a clean heart, a pure heart before the Lord. And then as he, as he talks about this, you know, you know, 
Again, our hands symbolize the activities of our life. Our holy hands represent a holy life. That's what Paul is teaching the men. And then he says, not with wrath and dissension, not causing trouble, not destroying relationships, not having uncontrolled emotions, having a holy heart with a holy lifestyle, a holy heart before God, a holy lifestyle with one another, not causing wrath, not causing problems, not causing trouble, uh, but having the right relationship in both ways. The holy heart. So men, that's, that's what is, that is the command to us on how we are to behave in the Lord's kingdom, how we are to behave in the body of Christ, that, that as we serve the Lord and live for God, we are, we are doing it with holy hands and a pure heart, not seeking to harm anybody, but are to build up one another in the body of Christ. That's the command for the men. Pray with holy hands, without wrath and dissension. Now for the women. This text is hotly debated, right? It, it's just it's one of these texts that you would love to go through the Bible and preach and never even touch this passage of Scripture. Maybe bring it to a men's breakfast, um, but you don't want to bring it to everybody, right? So let me read it again. And uh, we were talking earlier in our Sunday school class that, that um, with, you know, I'm glad things are um, the way they are now and not like they were in the days of Paul because Paul was in church, he was in the religious setting, and they didn't like what he was doing, so they just beat him up. And I'm glad nobody comes up here and tries to beat me up because they don't like what I'm, what I'm teaching. So let me read this, and then we'll talk about it. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 9 through 15. Likewise, important word, likewise, I want women to adorn themselves with proper clothing, modestly and discreetly, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly garments, but rather by means of good works, as is proper for women, making a claim to godliness. A woman must quietly receive instruction with entire submissiveness. But I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, but to remain quiet. For it was Adam who was created first, and then Eve. And it was not Adam who was deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. But women will be preserved, some versions say saved, so, but women will be preserved through the bearing of children if they continue in faith and love and sanctity with self-restraint. Oh my, look at the time. I think we're done. <laughs> so he says likewise. Notice he says likewise. That means that what he's going to say to the women is similar to what he's already said to the men. Otherwise, he wouldn't have said likewise there. So he, he's going to talk about character, right? He's talking about godly character for the men. Therefore, likewise, he's going to be talking about the same thing for the women, godly character. So women, if we want to use that word likewise to start with it, um, he says that we are to share, the women are to share similar godly actions as the men of the church, possibly when they pray, when they're worshiping the Lord, as this seems to be a lot of what's going to be uh, talked about here is going to be talked about either in the worship service or in the, in the, in the, the life of the church together. So, the, so in this, godliness is important. Godly behavior is for the men and for the women. So we need to make sure we, we understand that. That is the, you know, if we want to look at the summary of all of this, that's what... Paul is talking about godly behavior, a godly life for the men and for the women. So why does Paul use so much ink here on the women, talking about their clothes and their hair and their silence? Why does he spend so much time doing that? Well, there's several ideas of why, why this is done. And let me just give you a, a couple of those ideas. Some believe 
that Paul, being a Jew, remember he was a Jew raised in the Jewish religious setting, Jewish understanding of what it meant to be in the temple, what it meant to be in the synagogue, all these kinds of things. And just remember, in the temple there was the court of the Gentiles, which is as far as all the Gentiles can go, and then the next court that uh, all the Jews could go to was the court of women, okay? But just like the court of the Gentiles, that court of women it was named that way to show that that's as far as the women could go. And then there was the, um, the sanctuary area where men could go. And then there was a place where only the priests could go. And so there's this uh, funnel effect of who could be in the temple. And so there was already this understanding that in worship even, that the women only went so far in, in, the, in the area of the temple. The same thing happened in the synagogues of what the women could do and what the men would do. And some believe that Paul was just old-fashioned, that this is what he experienced in the synagogue all his life, and therefore, as he's looking around in these Gentile churches and what people are doing, he says, oh, no, no, we need to go back to the old way. And therefore, that's the reason that he's talking about these things of what the women are wearing and what they're saying and what they shouldn't say and, and, all, and, and things that they believed about the Bible and things like that. So that's, that's one um, thought that, that people have. Some, some people just actually think that Paul was anti-women, and so he was, every chance he got, he was writing something to put the women down and telling them that they couldn't do this and they couldn't do that, you know, keeping them in a servant role. Have some babies and everything's good, right? But some believe that there is something going on in this church in Ephesus. There's something going on there that Paul had to talk about, that that's the reason that he gets very specific about what he has to say to the men and to the women, that he's, in a, that he's addressing a problem. Remember, he came to Ephesus after his um, imprisonment, his house arrest in Rome, brought Timothy with him, left Timothy there. He saw what was going on, and then he left Timothy, and after he left Timothy, he wrote this letter and sent it back to Timothy to help him as he's leading this church. Okay, And so... As a result of that, some think, well, he saw something in that church and he has to address it. And so he addresses it in the letter and we have a copy of that. Okay? So what are we supposed to do with this text? Okay? Looking around for any braided hair, ladies. Um, okay? if, you know, if we take this text and say, well, okay, we've got to take this text literally... And, and take it from that culture into this culture and that situation into this situation, then there's a whole lot about what the women are doing with their hair and what they're doing with their clothing and things like that. And basically, do we say, okay, ladies, your contribution to the church, have babies, right? Have babies. You know, that's how it keeps the church growing, right? Have babies. That's your contribution. Is that what we're going to do with this passage of Scripture? Or are we going to look at it as I think we need to look at it and say Paul is addressing a situation. What can we understand from that? And then how do we apply that in our life today? I do think there was a problem that Paul was addressing. And, he, and he's specifically talking to that church about that problem. We have a record of it. Because we have a record in Scripture of where, um, the, where Paul isn't... Um, demeaning women, but honoring women. And again, there's a group that, you know, of, of a kind of a thought that Paul would try to dishonor women, but I think Paul spoke, sought to honor women in his ministry. Let me give you a couple of examples. In Acts 18.18, 18, it says uh, about Paul, Paul, having remained many days longer, took leave of the brethren and put out to sea for Syria, and with him were Priscilla, and Aquila. Priscilla's the girl. She's the wife. Aquila's the husband. Okay? And there's other places where it talks about Priscilla and Aquila as the ones who are teaching Apollos or things like that. And so why didn't he say Aquila and Priscilla? Right? Be because they're known as Priscilla and Aquila. If Paul was against women, that would have changed. He would have changed the order of their names and, and we would have known about that. Um, Paul, in his writings, greets 
the members of the church in the different churches that he's writing to and, and, and says, you know, there are a few people that he says, watch out for this guy, he's turned away or something like that. But for many of them, he's commending them for their service in the Lord. One of those examples is Romans 16.1. Paul says, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, who is a servant of the church, which is at Centria. A servant, this servant is the word that we get for deacon. The, the office of deacon, you know, is, is we take a word that means servant and we and we've make it a title, deacon. That's the word that he uses for Phoebe and commends her, right? If Paul was against women, he could just, if, if he didn't want to say anything, he just said nothing. If he doesn't want to talk about women, or unless he can dishonor them, he wouldn't have honored somebody like Phoebe. And so the, the times, when you start reading the Scripture, when, the, when Paul starts writing things that limit the women, it's in a couple of places, and it's in places that have problems. In Corinthians, we read the Corinthian letter, and we read what he says about women being silent and this and that about women. What was going on in Corinth? Problems were going on in Corinth. And so he has to address those very specific problems. He brings it up here uh, to Timothy about Ephesus. Something, he, he had actually predicted that false teaching would come in and he told Timothy he's leaving him there because of that false teaching. And so, uh, so there's something wrong in the teaching that's been going on in Ephesus, a problem, and now Paul gets very specific about some activities that are in the church. Um, and so, um, as, we, as we think about that, we, you know, we can ask, well, what were the problems? And there are some ideas. There are ideas out there of what the problems were. Um, one of the ideas is this uh, false teaching that was very prevalent in that day called Gnosticism. Okay? A word we don't probably use very much unless you study some of the New Testament writings and say this is, this is the false teaching that was probably going on there. But it's really a, a focus on knowledge, is where they get the word, on knowledge uh, and about having this special knowledge from God. And it's interesting because when Paul talked about salvation earlier, when he talked about salvation, he says God's will is for your salvation and to know and have the knowledge of the truth. And he uses the word knowledge there, which I think is interesting because that might have been this talk that was going around in Ephesus of, well, we have this knowledge, and that Paul had to um, put it in this, in this letter to remind Timothy, no, we have the knowledge of the truth, and we need to teach that knowledge. Um, uh, there, this might have been why um, Paul said that God desires that all people would be saved. That's his desire, that all people would be saved because the Gnostic teaching taught that God did choose, that some he chose not to be saved and some he chose to be saved, and that was his will. But Paul counteracts that by saying, no, God's will is that all people would be saved. And as far as the... The women's, the clothing and the hair and all this. Again, there's some other writings of thoughts about those particular days. And again, these are, these are conjecture about some of these things. But there are some writings and thoughts of those days that the Gnostic men, that the, the men that were a part of this movement, uh, they used this special knowledge for their own benefit and when they, when they used it for their own benefit, they would seek after the rich, wealthy women of the church. And so Paul is basically, what may have been happening as, is that these women are trying to look rich and wealthy to be attractive to these men that were a part of the church or at least part of the community with the clothing and the hairdos and things like that to try to attract them. And Paul's just saying, don't do that. Don't do that. Because for one, you don't need to attract those, those men. That's not what, what God is telling you to do. And there was, I don't know if you saw 
if you saw a lot, it's, it's been several years ago with Russell Crowe, the, the movie Noah, right? And then once you saw it go, that's not in the Bible, right? This story's not in the Bible. And then you, and then you recognize, well, we did some research after seeing it, should have done it before, but after we saw it, we did some research and found out that even in, in Judaism, they have these other myths of these other stories, a, a different story of creation and a different story of the flood and things like that. And this that actual story that's, that was presented by Hollywood is one of the myths. They didn't just make it up. They actually used a, a, a Jewish um, myth about, um, uh, about the flood that's different than the Bible. And so that's what they used to make this story, the, and the way it, that's why it came out so weird. Um, and, but, but those things happen. And as a result of that, there is a different, you know, we don't see this stuff floating around now, but there were at times... The, this idea of floating around of creation that God actually created woman first and then created man, okay? And it was man's fault that they sinned. So this, this, this kind of this other myth, this other story was out there and some people grabbed a hold of it and believed it. It's like they read it on the internet, right? Um, it was on Facebook, so it had to be true. And so they, um, and so they, they, they believed that. And so that... There's, there's thoughts that that's what these Gnostics were teaching is that this idea of creation. And that's why Paul is saying, no, 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 Adam was created first, then the woman. You know, let's get our, let's get our facts straight. And even to the point of the idea of children, children that were born were evil. And in some, some of this false teaching that the children were born they were evil, and Paul said, no, no, have children. You know, this is God's will. This is God's plan. And so there's conjecture. I don't know if all this is right. I don't know what the exact situation is, but there's conjecture and interpretation and trying to understand what was going on about why Paul would have said all those things um, that he said to the women in that. And I, again, I don't know, but I look at this passage of Scripture and I recognize this passage of Scripture looks different than what other places, things that Paul's writing. And so, is it different because he's dealing with a specific problem, or did Paul just change his mind about things over time? I think he was dealing with a specific problem. I can't tell you exactly what all those specific problems were, but I think that's what he was doing. Because then we open up all of Scripture, and we see um, how all of Scripture teaches us about who we are in Christ and how we're supposed to treat one another and how we're supposed to live our life. The very last part of verse 15 is really where it gets to, this is what women need to do. This is the correct behavior. Continue in faith and love and sanctity with self-restraint. That's Paul's instructions to the women. Continue in faith and love and sanctity with self-restraint. That's the same thing he said to the men. Different words, but the same idea. A holy and pure life, no wrath or dissension. Faith and love and sanctity with self-restraint. Godliness, holiness, living according to God's plan, not your own plan. And so for men and women, I believe, as we see in Scripture today. For men and women, I believe that God commands us to live a holy life de dedicated to God. The command is for both of us, all of us, to live this life. And that is what leads to good behavior in church. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for um, this time and this opportunity, again, to open your word. And Lord, as we looked at this passage of Scripture, uh, I just humbly come before you, Father, with this explanation and just pray, Father, uh, that it's according to your will. Um, and I, and um, I just pray, Father, that we would know your truth and understand your truth um, and live according to your truth. To not take Scriptures um, and to use them for power, um, for our own benefit, um, but, Father, to, to read and learn and grow and follow you. And so I pray, Father, that we would live a holy life before you. In Jesus' name, amen.
As we have our invitation song this morning, uh, we do want to give you that opportunity. Put your faith in Christ, to follow Christ, to live for Christ. If you need to make any decision with that, please come forward. If you have a prayer request, um, I'll be down here and feel free to come forward and we'll pray for you as well. Let's stand together.